of the A to Z of iconography with Ipsen and with me your host Kurushtalal I hope you liked yesterday's episode today is B and it's B for Buddha probably one of the most famous sons of India of a long time so the buddha also known as gautama prince siddhartha shakyamuni was a philosopher who was born in the 6th century bc and who preached a very very interesting doctrine a doctrine that was very very different from any of the doctrines that existed at that time the prevalent religion in india was brahmanism it was a religion that demanded a lot of sacrifices and a lot of offerings and a lot of continuous interaction which was bleeding the riot dry as so the riot felt rising up from the caste of the kshatriyas we have two great reformers the buddha and the jina of whom we will talk later and today we are going to speak about the buddha the buddha basically uh, started off as preaching a philosophy which subsequently went on to become a global religion as we know it today a religion of peace and a religion of understanding a religion of brotherhood the earliest worship of the buddha was not iconic it was an iconic iconic worship only started much later and somewhere about 600 years after the death of the buddha in the first century ad buddhism went through various different iterations various different changes and evolutions just like any philosophy any religion does we have the theravada buddhists the mahayana buddhists the vajrayana buddhists we have born we have zen just to mention a very very few of the different schisms in buddhism and then there were further smaller schisms within the greater schisms at its very essence buddhism basically is a philosophy that says that all life is essentially made up of desire this desire leads to pain the only way to liberate yourself from this pain and from this desire and this continuous cycle of desire and pain is to give up desire and this is nirvana the path of achieving this giving up of desire is essentially nirvana is the freedom from desire and the achievement of this nirvana ultimately leads to moksha or liberation it's a very very simple philosophy to look at it but it's actually an incredibly deep philosophy all the paths to salvation were tried by the young buddha or the young gautama as he was then before he attained buddhahood and what he realized was that extreme hedonism and extreme austerity were both equally bad and that truly to give up was not to embrace either extreme but to take the middle path he talked about a madhyamika marga and the madhyamika marga consisted of what was often called the eight the eight fold ways or the eight fold path it was right views right intentions right speech right actions right learning right mindfulness right education and right consciousness so the buddha had tried his extreme austerity as you can see on the right hand side and this is the very famous fasting buddha image in the kandaran style from the lahore museum probably one of the most amazingly impressive images of the buddha ever made one of the most anatomically perfect images that i have ever seen from ancient india uh the buddha was essentially born into a royal family and as the legend of the buddha grows when he was born his father was told by the court seers that he would either become one of the greatest kings the world had ever known or one of the greatest ascetics the world had ever known so to make sure that he did not become an ascetic his father hid him from the ways of the world and from all the sorrows and it was only in his adulthood that he realized what pain what longing what suffering what disease and what death were and he was mightily shaken by it he left his house and his family and his wife and his child wandered ultimately till he achieved enlightenment sitting under a bodhi tree and he then went on to preach to the others that this life was just a continuous cycle of pain and it was essential to break free of the cycle and to achieve moksha via nirvana so sadly he was a misogynist for his time it was not very difficult women did have an inferior position i remember as i was growing up one of my favorite stories 
was that of the Buddha and his disciple Ananda. And his disciple Ananda asked the Buddha, Ananda was of course the Buddha's closest and first disciple. And he asked the Buddha, he said, how should we deal with women master? And the Buddha said, as of not seeing them, Ananda. Ananda, of course, is a persuasive sort. And he Sir? said, what if we must see them? Yes. Sorry to interrupt, but your mic is rubbing against something and uh, there's a lot of ba- sound in the background. Can okay. you hold it in your hand? Okay, I'm doing so now. So, um, well, to get back to what I was saying, um, Ananda then, of course, being the persistent man that he was, said, what if we must see them, my Lord? And the Buddha said, then no speaking, Ananda. And further onwards goes Ananda to say, but what if we must speak to them, Lord? And the Buddha says, then be very careful, Ananda. And I realized in this that there was an enormous, I mean, there was wit in the creation of this dialogue, but there was also an enormous amount of misogyny, which is, well, very much in keeping with the way in which things were in the ancient days when women were considered inferior to men. Of course, Buddhism has changed over the years and many things have changed. In the life of the Buddha itself, women were allowed to join the Sangha and many, many things have changed since then. The original way in which the Buddha was worshipped was in what is called the an-iconic manner. So he was either worshipped in the tumuli that was raised above him when he was dead, which is the stupa that is seen in the top left corner. He was also worshipped as the Bodhi tree under which he had sat when he attained Nibbana or Nirvana. And you see that in the bottom left hand side corner. In the center at the top is the famous diamond throne of the Buddha supposedly built by the Emperor Ashoka and shown, depicted on the Bharut Stupa and actually excavated at Mahabodhi when excavations were carried out by Alexander Cunningham in the end of the 19th century. Below are a pair of imprints of the feet of the Buddha with the various different Lakshanas and those are also worshipped in an aniconic form. On the top right hand side is the wheel of Dhamma that was turned by the Buddha in the Dharma Chakra Pravartana and that too is an aniconic symbolic form of worship of the Buddha. And finally on the bottom right you have the ladders which the Buddha used to go up into the heavens and to preach to the gods before he came back to mankind. And alongside it, you have his famous throne and you have the Bodhi tree under which he meditated. So a lot of these aniconic forms were originally used to represent the Buddha and no human shape was used to represent him directly. This is a very interesting departure in many ways from what we see today. And uh, it wasn't for a very, very long time that the Buddha was actually represented in a humaniform or an iconic manner. This is the Mahabodhi tree at Bodh Gaya. And uh, it is a descendant of a descendant of a descendant of the original Bodhi tree under which the Buddha is supposed to have sat. It has sickened and died a number of times. It has been destroyed a number of times, but there has always been a sapling born of this tree ready to take its place. And even today, saplings from this tree are given to important dignitaries who visit here. One of the saplings, according to legend, was taken to Sri Lanka and was planted there and still survives there in its original, well, state. And there was also another one planted by Ananda. And that too exists at Vaishali even today. So uh, the Bodhi tree is perhaps the greatest representation of the aniconic worship of the Buddha. The first time we see an icon of the Buddha, surprisingly, is on the coins of the great Kushana Emperor Kanishka. Sometime around the first century AD, the Kushanas were members of a very interesting tribe called the Yuchi, who came from the roof of the world, from um, the eastern domains of the Chinese Empire, and came down through the northeastern, northwestern passes into India, and into the northwestern frontier provinces, and the Punjab and Afghanistan. Uh, They've created an entire state of their own, which existed at one time from the Central Asian highlands all the way down to Mathura and the Ganga Valley. And the greatest of these emperors was perhaps the Emperor Kanishka. You see one of his gold coins over here. 
and on the gold coins of the Kushanas and the, and the copper coins of the Kushanas, you see a number of deities. And amongst them is this beautiful iconic representation of the Buddha. You see the Buddha here, you see his name alongside it, Bodo, written in Greek. You see the Tamga mark of Kanishka himself on the other side of the Buddha. You see the Buddha Nimbet, there is the Nimbus around him. There is a Ushnish on his head. You see the curls of the Buddha's hair. You see his robes and the folds of his robes. You see his right hand raised up, his left hand clutching a part of his garment. And his right hand is raised in a mudra called the Abhaya Mudra, which says, do not fear and take refuge within me. So the earliest Buddhas that we know of, apart from the Kushana coins, are the so-called Gandhara style of Buddhas. So in the, in the Northwest Frontier Province region, we had a Greco-Roman influence style. And you see the very, very Greek style of styling the nose, styling the body, styling the robes. And these are typical Gandharan Buddhas, where the Buddha's head is shown with curls. There is the Ushnish on his head. His eyes are shown almost closed. There is a small dot on his forehead. His robes are very much like the Greco-Roman robes and the folds are very, very visible. And his long ear lobes. So this is the early iconography of the Buddha. In the Gandharan style, you also have various different scenes from the life of the Buddha, also done in the Gandharan style. And you have images of Bodhisattvas, which you see on the left-hand side, which are the previous avatars of the Buddha as a human, but not yet having attained Buddhahood. So the Gandharan style was responsible in many, many ways for some of the earliest depictions of the Buddha. And they were heavily, heavily influenced by the Greek style of art. At the same time, in the heart of India, in the Mathura region, we have the rise of the Mathura style, one of the first truly great styles of Indian art, which depict the Buddha. And in this style, you see the Buddha depicted as he is often described in Buddhist writings with the chest of a lion and the waist of a deer and slightly disproportionate in the earlier period because it is exactly these descriptions that are being followed by the artists. The robes are almost transparent or translucent and uh, very often you will see only one half of the chest covered by the robes. The Ushnish, the protuberance of the top of the Buddha's head is often covered either in curls, very, very tight curls, or in a beautiful swirl as seen on the left-hand side. And the Lakshanas on his feet are very, very visible, as are those on his hands. Once again, here you see the Buddha in the Abhaya Mudra, with the right hand raised upwards, palm facing outwards. This is the fear not mudra, as it's called, and is also the one which basically asks you to take refuge within him and his teachings. We also have a culmination of the style in what we usually call the Gupta style. And these are some of the Gupta style images. And we have some beautiful gilded bronzes during this period. And we see a beautiful amalgamation of what appears to be the Gandhara style and the Mathura style coming together to give us the truly Indian style of art that we see henceforth in India. So this is the typical gesture known as the Abhaya Mudra, one of the most prominent gestures that you will see in the iconography of the Buddha. So the serene face, the half-closed eyes, the elongated ear lobes, the curly hair, the protuberance on the top of his head, which looks like a top knot but is not, is basically the Ushnish on his head, which is covered with the curls. And of course, the beautiful folds of his Sangati, which he is wearing. The other very important mudra in which you will see the iconography of the Buddha is known as the Dhamma Chakra Pravartana Mudra. This is the Buddha setting the wheel of Dharma into motion. And uh, this is a very beautiful image from Sarnath. It's in the Sarnath Museum even today. And you can actually see the wheel in the bottom portion. And you can see the two hands entwined in the motion of setting into a motion the wheel of Dhamma. In most of the East and in most of the modern images today, this is the most common mudra in which the Buddha is shown. This, of course, is a Gandharan image telling you that it is an image 
that is virtually timeless in the creation of Buddha images. This is known as the Dhyana Mudra or the Mudra of Concentration or the Mudra of Meditation. And this is the Buddha shown in Dhyana Mudra. If you look very closely, most of the Eastern forms of Buddhism will use this as its most common mudra. This is perhaps one of the other few very, very common mudras in which you will find the Buddha. This is known as the Bhumi Sparsha Mudra. This is the Buddha calling the earth to bear witness. So very, very specifically, the earth is called to bear witness. And with his right hand, the Buddha reaches forward and touches the earth. More often than not, the Buddha will be shown seated upon a lotus pedestal and his left hand will be folded and will be turned upwards towards his stomach and will rest in his lap. The right hand will rest on the shin, face turned inwards, fingers outstretched and touching the earth. So this is the Bhumi Sparsha Mudra. Apart from this, there is also a very, very interesting iconography of the various different important moments in the life of the Buddha that get repeated. The conception of the Buddha is known as the dream of Mara, Maya. And you see this on the top left hand side from a panel from the Bharat Stupa in the Indian Museum in Calcutta today. And there is a very beautiful image of the Queen Maya sleeping in her chambers with her attendants. And there's a white elephant that enters a womb. And this is one of the most important symbols of the Buddha and the conception of the Buddha. You then have the birth of the Buddha born from the side of Maya. And you see that in a beautiful Gandharan frieze from the Ashmolean Museum on the left-hand lower part. The upper portion on the right-hand side and the lower one both represent the great departure. This is the leaving of the Buddha from his palace from his kingly uh, abode and leaving all of his worldly possessions behind. Now on the top, you have an image in the an iconic form, form, which you see at the stupa at Sanji. And if you notice here on the bottom of that upper panel on the right hand side, there is a horse moving away. So this horse represents the Kshatriya Buddha prince, the young prince, and it is an iconic and therefore there is no prince in it but there is an umbrella bearer in the chariot behind, uh, signifying the royalty of the horse that is preceding and therefore the representation of the young prince Siddhartha. On the bottom, you have a frieze, which is 200 years later from Amravati, part of the Amravati marbles. And in this, you actually see the young prince seated upon the horse with the umbrella bearer holding the umbrella above him, telling you, the shift that has taken place between Sanchi and Amravati and how the iconographic representation of the great departure has now shifted from an iconic to iconic. There are some other very, very interesting moments in the life of the Buddha, which are also portrayed. On the left-hand side is the miracle at Shravasti. It is portrayed by the Buddha levitating above the ground, water pouring from the lower half of his body flames rising from his shoulders, but his hand outstretched in Abhaya Mudra. <coughs> the miracle of Chavasti is a very, very important moment in the life of the Buddha and in Buddhism. And therefore, this iconic form is very, very well known as it represented at a large number of places. But perhaps by far the even better known is the Mahaparinirvana or the Mahaparinibbana of the Buddha. This is the Buddha passing away from this world into the next when he finally gives up his prana. So the Buddha is always shown lying down on his right hand side with his right hand folded under his head. And this is called the Parinirvana pose. And we will find it in a large number of places in, Gan in the Gandharan style. We will see this at Ajanta in cave 21 and so on and so forth and in a large number of places. The death of the Buddha is depicted as this. You see the lamenting people around him. And this is the, well, virtually the iconography of the death of the Buddha. Along with the Buddha, you have some very, very interesting other representations. This is the Avalokiteshvara. The Avalokiteshvara is often called Padmapani because he holds a lotus. On the left-hand side is a painting of the Avalokiteshvara 
as seen at Ajanta. In the center is a beautiful gilded copper image from Sri Lanka. And on the right hand side is a beautiful polished shisht image of the Pala period. Along with the Avalokiteshwara, we also have certain other manifestations, some of which are incredibly rare. This is the famous 11 headed Avalokiteshwara on which Dr. Suraj Pandit has done quite a bit of work from the Kaneri Caves. And this image is perhaps the oldest image in the world and only one that we know of to date in India. We also have alongside the Avalokiteshwara, very often shown according to some a consort, according to some a manifestation, depending on which way you look at it, is perhaps one of the only female deities in Buddhism known as Tara. There is a beautiful wooden Tara that was recovered from the Kaneri Caves. And you can see the seated Tara on the left-hand side. In the center is a Pala period Tara. And on the right-hand side is Tara in one of her numerous forms seen in Vajrayana Buddhism in Tibet and in those areas. The Buddha images first follow a very, very strict hierarchy of where they are and when they are in a cave. And the later period as royal patronage of Buddhism disappears, the Buddhist caves are kept alive by patrons giving monies in exchange for various punyas that they can gain amongst which are the carving of Buddha images. And you see a large number of intrusive Buddha images which do not follow any systematic plan, which do not seem to follow any story or any narrative on the caves and the temples of the Buddhists in India. This is one very similar such example. I think if I'm not wrong, this is cave number 90. At Kaneri, you see the central panel and you see the multiple images of different sizes and different degrees of crudity and laxity that have been put in. On the extreme top right-hand side, there is a beautiful Padmapani image of the Avalokiteshvara. Then there is the Buddha with four Buddhas around him. And there are various Buddha images on the left and right of the main panel, which is what was supposed to be there in this cave. Buddhism spread far and wide. And with that, the iconography of the Buddha also spread. And the styles in which the Buddha was depicted also changed. In Tibet, you have a lot of painted images. You have a lot of beautifully painted silk tankas. And you see a typical Buddhist Vajrayana style Buddha on the top left hand side. The Longmen grottos with the Chinese Buddhas you see on the right hand side. And you see a beautiful image of the Buddha over there in the center. On the bottom left is perhaps one of the most important and least mentioned uh, Buddhist shrines in the world, the shrine of Dambula in Sri Lanka, uh, virtually in continuous worship for the past 2,200 years, as seen from the Ashokan style Brahmi inscriptions over there. Uh, next to it, you see a typical Buddha image from Thailand, where the Buddha is shown in a very elongated form uh, the limbs no longer have the plasticity that they have in the Gandharan and the uh, Gupta schools and the Pala schools, but there is a lot of flowing. The elbows seem to flow one into the other. Uh, heavily elongated fingers and toes. A very, very tall Ushnish and a flame coming out of the Ushnish, uh, which you can see in that image. Next to it, you have an image from Laos. In the Dhyana Mudra, by the way, the Thai image is in the Bhuvi Sparsha Mudra. The image on the top left is in the Dharma Chakra Pravartana Mudra. You have the Dhyana Mudra image from Laos. And once again, you see the uh, smoothening of the limbs, uh, very typically seen in the late Sena period and elsewhere. And on the extreme right hand side, you have a beautiful Japanese Buddha. And you see the Buddha in his Dhyana Mudra form typically in Japan, all of them are sitting irrespective of where you see them on lotus thrones. So this is the typical iconography of the Buddha. And of course, there are various legends, various forms of the Buddha, the Buddhas that have gone in the past, the Buddhas that will come in the future, and they all have their own iconographies. But to keep it simple, this is the basic iconography of the Buddha. And if you notice, any of these mudras or any of these moments in the life of the Buddha, you will be able to identify that this is a Buddha image, a Buddha painting, a Buddha statue that you are looking at. So that was B for Buddha.
thank you very much for listening to me. It's been a pleasure talking about this. If you liked what you heard, please press the bell icon and subscribe. Please follow us and please give us a thumbs up below. And we'll come back to you on Monday with C and it will be C for Chamunda. So looking forward to seeing you all on Monday. Thank you very, very much for being with us.